Amen. You may be Amen. seated. All right, now I've got to put on the afterburners here and get through this sermon. I know you got ham in the oven. Nobody likes cold ham or overcooked ham. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're doing this together today, so wake up your neighbor. Here we go, all right? This is our fifth and final week in a series we've called Risen. And in this series, we've been celebrating that God brings life. And we have seen through Scripture that we don't even have to wait until Jesus' resurrection to see where God has the power over death, that God is the God of resurrection. Week one, we looked at the first resurrection was the prophet Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, right? And we, we talked about from that, we needed to recognize our bones were dry, right? Acknowledge the true state of things. Number two, we talked about repeating God's words, not our own. Our profession of faith is according to God's words, not our own fears. And then third, no, we, we know a new posture as children of God. Week two, we looked at the resurrection story of Jonah, and Jonah showed us through his resurrection uh, from, the, from the big fish uh, that our prayers should be precise, should be full of passion, and from a posture of deliverance and not for deliverance. Week three, blah, week three was Lazarus uh, and the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, and we learned so much from this final public ministry of Jesus. We, we learned three big thoughts. God's love permits pain. So we need to discern our circumstances through God's love, not God's love through our circumstances. Number two, God's love permits delays, right? Remember Jesus waited two days, just kind of hung out before he went over. Our response to delays is often a clue to where God's working on inside us in the midst of it. And God's delay is never God's denial. Thirdly, from Lazarus, we learn that God's love is from heaven's perspective, that God is always working from a perspective of eternity. He's always working for our good and his glory. We also dug into the story a little deeper with Lazarus to, to see how Jesus kind of included Lazarus's biblical community in the process of bringing new life. Remember through those, those, those last three commands, roll away the stone, remove the grave clothes, let him go. Oh, it was so good. Last week, also amazing, Pastor Laura, or Pastor Elizabeth, both pastors are amazing, um, but Pastor Elizabeth preached last week uh, around the triumphal entry of Jesus uh, into the beginning and brought us into the beginning of Holy Week, showing us the kingship of Jesus, setting up the infinite value of Jesus as the Messiah, and showing us the heartache that Jesus felt at the rejection of the Jewish nation, and also highlighting his willingness to embrace the cross for you and for me. Today, well, today, it's probably no surprise, this series culminates with the greatest resurrection of all, of Jesus, that his death and resurrection means that sin will never have the final say, and that you and I can experience the life-giving resurrection power of Jesus and experience new life today because of him. All right? Shake your neighbor. Tell them, buckle up. Go ahead. Give them a shake. Buckle up. Here we go. All right? When Jesus was crucified 30, at th in 33 AD, there were only about 120 faithful followers left in total. 120. Gone were the multitudes. They were defeated. They were disillusioned. They were disoriented. But somehow, that dejected group became the seed that blossomed into a worldwide movement. 2,000 years later, listen to this, 2.3 billion people who are alive on planet Earth today claim to be followers of Christ. Now, that means one in three people alive today say that they are followers of Jesus. One in three on the planet. Now, in North America, that kind of seems uh, maybe a little bit impossible um, uh, because of the way that we kind of hear about things in, nor in North America. But the Christian church is by far the largest organization on planet Earth. Nothing comes even close to it in size. Not China, not Europe. As a matter of fact, you would have to take every living soul in China and Europe 
uh, and in, in the United States and combine them together to even come close to the size of the living, breathing Christian church today. It's larger than the entire population of the Western Hemisphere. Nothing is bigger than the church of Jesus Christ on the planet. How? Like, how did that happen? Why did Christianity spread so far, so fast, and last these past 2,000 plus years? How did a little band of like 11 poor fishermen plus 120 scared followers huddled up in an upper room ever expand to be 2.3 billion people on the planet today? And the answer is one word. Resurrection. It's, it, the resurrection changed everything. When God said, I'm going to come to earth and I'm going to die for the sins of all mankind and then I'm going to prove that I'm God by after being buried for three days, I'm going to rise from the dead? That's the single most significant event in history. Nothing comes close to it. In spite of the story of human, uh, it split the story of humankind between A.D. and B.C. Every event in history, think about it, every event is history in history is measured by its distance from the resurrection of Jesus, either before or after. Let me make it a little bit more personal this morning. Have you ever considered that even your birthday is measured by the day and the month and the year it was from Jesus' resurrection. You may be sitting here today and maybe not even consider or believe the resurrection of Jesus, but its very significance in your life is present in the way your days are numbered. The resurrection is by far the single most important event in history. And for those of us in the room today who've already experienced the same power that raised Christ from the dead can testify when you experience him. When you know him, he still changes everything. And for those in the room today, maybe you, you, you've not come to experience this resurrection power. Let me be clear and frank with you today. My goal is to help you consider... Actually, no, my goal is to help you discover that this 2,000-year-old resurrection event can be a right now reality in your life. No one in the room today will walk out of these doors without making a decision about what you're going to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God, today we celebrate the biggest moment in all of human history, the resurrection of Jesus. And I am completely inadequate to bring the truth that is before us. But your spirit is alive. Your spirit's alive and well, and your word is active, so your word, so word of God, speak. Spirit of God, open our eyes to see the sun today, risen and seated at the right hand of God. Amen. If Pastor Laura was preaching this sermon today, it would have started with a would-you-rather game. All right? So I'm going to give it a little quick shot here. Uh, Easter version. Would you rather eat chocolate bunnies or marshmallow peeps? How many marshmallow peeps in the room? Yeah, right? Okay, there's a few of you crazy folks. All right, chocolate bunnies? Oh, yeah, all over the place. Okay, how many of you would only eat carrots for the rest of your life or hard-boiled eggs? How many carrots? Oh, there's excitement about hard-boiled eggs. I see it right there. Look at that, two hands. All right. Okay, here's the final one. Would you rather have bunny ears or bunny teeth? How many of you would rather bunny ears? Yeah, okay, and the teeth? Okay, a few woodchucks in the room. All right, that's fine. That's fine. You see, life is filled with decisions. Either or decisions. I'll, I'll either follow the speed limit sign or not follow the speed limit sign. I'll either obey my parents or disobey them. I'll either marry this person or I won't marry this person. I'll either fight this addiction and live or I'll give in and be destroyed by it. Or if you're like me, some of the maybe other guys in the room here, you know, you will either choose to 
tickle your wife's feet while she's sitting on the couch and die, or leave her alone and live. <laughs> Life is filled with either or decisions, big ones. But the one decision that will define and shape your life for now and eternity is whether you choose to accept or reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But for today, I want to look at the biblical record of the resurrection as reported by the Apostle Luke in chapter 24. Let's read it 1 through 9. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen laying by themselves, and he went away, wandering to himself. What had happened? Indeed, Peter. What in the world had happened. It wouldn't be an Easter service if there weren't just a few people in the room today who are here saying, you know what? I'm with Peter. I'm just not sure what I think about this whole resurrection thing. Frankly, I have no interest in the resurrection, but it was the only way I could get a free lunch out of my (laughs) mother-in-law. And your response really is all not altogether unreasonable. The first Easter morning started with just about as much doubt. Luke, verse 1, on the first day of the week, early in the morning, we just read it, the woman took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. So we see here, right away, that these ladies hadn't set their alarms or spent some sleepless night waiting in anticipation of running out and taking in the miraculous resurrection of Jesus, their Messiah. On the contrary... They were sneaking under the cover of darkness ahead of the crowd to pay their last respects. They were bringing spices to aid in the embalming of Jesus. And the disciples, they were so dejected that they hadn't even bothered to to go to the tomb. They had already moved on, likely trying to figure out how they were going to get their old jobs back, maybe trying to split up a little bit of the money that they had left over to kind of get get back on their feet and get started again. The women and the men who followed Jesus started off Easter morning discouraged, dejected, depressed. Their hope was dead on Easter morning. Their expectations were shaped and constrained by the events that had been taking place in the days prior. And maybe that's you this morning. Waking up, sneaking into Easter morning with little to no expectation. Like the followers of Jesus, your hope has been curtailed, maybe even constrained by the events of the days that have gone by. If that's you this morning, here with little to no expectation, can I suggest that you're contending with the same issue that faced the women as they approached the tomb? What are you going to do with the stone or obstacle that's been placed between you and Jesus? If that is you this morning, I have really good news right out of the gate here in verse 2. Verse 2, Luke 24, verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. 
So, so what is it for you, that, that big thing that's been placed in your life that keeps you from getting up and looking for Jesus? Is it a stone of pain from unexpected loss? Maybe a stone of doubt from questions that you haven't even asked, asked yet because you didn't really expect to find an answer? Maybe it's a stone of offense or unforgiveness from the hurt of another. A stone of past rejection. A stone of fear of what it might cost you if you find Jesus alive after all. I, I don't know what it is for you. But I bet you do. I think you do. That thing that seems too big to move, that thing that keeps you from expecting anything from Jesus. John's account says it was an angel who, like an earthquake, rolled the stone away. And honestly, I don't care much who did the rolling. The important thing for us to realize this morning is that God has already provided supernatural power to take care of the obstacle you expected to find between you and Jesus. It's just a matter of choosing to get up and get on the way, uh, get away from the crowd and start looking for him. Three days earlier, when Jesus said, it is finished, he was referring to the very obstacle that hinders you today from pursuing him. Jesus has already prepared a place for your arrival. He's already dealt with the obstacle that you expected to be in the way when you went looking for him. And my prayer is even now, as you consider this, that you would be like the women who would at least had the willingness to get up and start looking for Jesus. Moving on, verse 3, but they entered and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And maybe this is a better description of you today. Maybe this is exactly what you were afraid of. I, I don't know about you, but I've been there. I've been there looking for Jesus, but it seems like he's nowhere to be found. And the reality is we're not alone. There's a long list of Old and New Testament heroes who recorded there. Where the heck are you? Cries. Job said, I cry out to you, God, but you don't answer me. David said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jeremiah said, why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? And Paul said he cried out three times for the Lord to remove his affliction. Heroes of the faith and just like you and me filled with despair and worry and hopelessness. So what is the answer when we're looking for God in the midst of our pain? Let's look back at the women here in the first Easter morning, stepping into the, to the, stepping into the empty tomb. Verse 4, chapter 24. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men clothed in, in sorry, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed in their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Verse 8, Then they remembered his words. That's it. That's the key. Verse 8, Then they remembered his word. To find God in the midst of our doubt and pain, Scripture reminds us to remember, to recite His words, to worship, if you will. And we see this response in the dejected heroes we talked about earlier. Job said in his pain, though he may slay me, yet I will hope in him. David said, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Jeremiah said, yet this I call to mind and therefore, uh, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. And of course, Paul said in Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the the Lord always. Again, I say it, rejoice. Remembering the words of God, remembering God's word, his promises, his character, and focusing our hearts and our minds on the scripture 
Steering our spirits on worship on how, 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 is how we answer the human condition of where the heck are you? So Mary and the women are reminded of Jesus' words and then, with hope, they wonder and rush back to tell the men. Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. And scripture says, and the men leapt with joy and ran out looking for Jesus. No, it doesn't say that at all. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. You know, sometimes the very people you expect to celebrate your newfound hope of resurrection will think you're crazy. Because normal life doesn't often include resurrection outside of the church. Verse 12, to some, the thought of new life is ultimately just nonsense. Peter, however, he got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Side note, curiosity is sometimes the first step in finding resurrection. So here we have it. Easter morning version 1.0. Isn't it exciting? Isn't it inspiring? No. no. Thank you. All right. <laughs> no. It's a big mess. The women are crazy. The men are in disbelief. The disciples were either going to have to find themselves another Messiah or pack up the whole thing and go home. This beta version of Easter morning may not have started off as you may have expected. But maybe you're relating to it a little more than you thought you might. What I want to do now that we've set up this kind of first Easter is I want to fast forward just a few weeks in Scripture. Can we do that together? Are you still with me? All right, we good? Okay, here we are at Easter morning, the women with their spices, the men with their disbelief, the bewilderment, the amazement, the confusion, uh, the disappointment, all sitting there at the edge of the bed on Easter morning. But if we turn just a few pages to another book of Luke's and Acts chapter 2, we discover that same Peter, who came away from the tomb wondering what on earth had happened, is now standing in front of thousands and giving a masterful view of the whole story of, redemption, of, of the redemptive history. And in the midst of his preaching, it kind of reaches this crescendo in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, where, where he's recorded as saying, Fellow Israelites, I tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, David said, and knew that God had promised him and on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Verse 31, seeing what has to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he was received from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. So what's happening here in Acts chapter 2 uh, is, is God's promise in the giving of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in the first believers. The promise of Jesus to his followers who after encountering Jesus on the day of Easter, for several weeks following, they waited for him in the upper room and then they received uh, the promised Holy Spirit that would lead and guide them into the, all the truth they needed. This promise that Peter was referring to is now actually happened, and the result of this dramatic transformation is not only Peter, but the whole contingency who we just left on the edge of the bed pining away on Easter morning. And it's a radical makeover traced to one historic fact, the fact of the resurrection. Peter, the very one who denied Jesus just a few short weeks ago earlier to a little servant girl, is now standing amongst the thousands gathered around the temple, confronting them, not with a philosophy, not with a program, but with a person risen from the dead. 
It's only a matter of seven weeks since they were all scattered out of the garden during Jesus' arrest and arraignment. And now we see Peter again, the one who denied him so vehemently, make this bold, dramatic, and very public claim. And there's no, and, and, and so the fundamental question here is, how do we account for such a radical change? The disciples were totally demoralized on Good Friday. They were completely confused and confounded on Easter Sunday. But in a matter of a few short weeks, we find them on the streets of Jerusalem with their cowardice completely replaced with an almost reckless abandonment. And the answer that the Bible gives for this dramatic change is that Jesus is alive from the dead. This is why Peter and the disciples went out and did what they did. It's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John went on later to record their own account of the historical facts concerning Jesus. It is impossible to fathom, outside of the fact that the disciples were absolutely convinced of the factual historical resurrection of Jesus, there would never be a thing called Christianity. Without the resurrection, there wouldn't be one word of the New Testament put to pen. There, there wouldn't have been any reason for it. Professor and author F.F. F. Bruce said it this way, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, we should probably never have heard of him. Some Galilean carpenter in his day, long ago in a small province of a remote part of the country, doing his things. He would have been one of many teachers of his day that roamed around and eventually died and his followers would have dissipated were it not for the fact of the resurrection. And it's interesting when you think of it, you, when you do a quick survey of scripture, you really don't see the apostles making a lot of time or argument or defense of the resurrection. The closest would be Paul's defense in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said to the Corinthian church in verse 3, I pass on to you what was most important and what had been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Jesus, uh, just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Verse 5, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Essentially, Paul says, Listen, if, if you don't believe me, ask the 500 plus other people who saw him and are still alive talking about it. Other than that, not much argument. No proofs, no explanation. Because they themselves were the evidence. Their stories, their life change completely and entirely by contact with the risen Jesus shows us that the material that is given to us regarding the resurrection is first historical. Christianity is a historical faith. The impact of this risen Jesus of Nazareth on the entirety of human race that followed him is undeniable. Peter writes in first, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The Apostle John said in 1 John 1, that which, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked on and our hands have touched, we proclaim concerning the word of life. There was a, a tactile element to their testimony. There was no question, uh, no questioning their conviction of the reality of it for a moment. Don't kid yourself. They had been thoroughly crushed by the death of Jesus and amazingly energized by the factual awareness of Jesus' triumph over death and the grave. So returning back to Peter, standing among the throngs in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, we see him deliver not a flowery emotional anecdote, not a parable, not a fable, but an eyewitness account of what had happened. He didn't mince any words at all. To the crowd in verse 23, he said, This man speaking of Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, he said to them, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And there wasn't a man or boy or woman or girl in Jerusalem who could have argued with that. Every one of them knew. Without, uh, they knew the crucifixion of Jesus had happened. 
Acts 2.24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, he said, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And as we read earlier from Paul, there were people in that day, 500 plus living and moving around the shops in Jerusalem who would testify of seeing him, some on multiple occasions, even with the threat of death. The historical realities of the gospel story go beyond the Bible. Jewish and Roman historians affirm that he was executed in Judea when Pontius Pilate was the governor. And after that, his followers still worshipped him as God and declared him to be the Messiah. There is no question of the historical claim of the church. It's an either-or decision. Because Christianity is not like any other religion. Buddhism can get along fine without Buddha, but Christianity does not exist for a moment without Christ. If Christ is not alive, Scripture says, we who are followers are all most to be pitied. The resurrection is historical, and the resurrection is rational. You, know, we have, you may have friends and neighbors, and you may be here in the room today and reject it, but there is a clear and rational reason for the resurrection in the framework of a biblical worldview. God created man for relationship with him, and we rejected him, uh, and, and, and our sins separate us from God. And those sins, the only way they can be paid for is not by good deeds, but by a sacrifice, and that sacrifice has to be of, of immense eternal value and last forever. And so rationally, The only thing God could do was come down himself and pay the price. That life in Jesus includes resurrection. The whole new beginning that answers the longing of every human heart. A longing for forgiveness and righteousness and peace and joy. And it's found in resurrection because resurrection is not a thing. Resurrection wasn't an event. Resurrection is a person. The resurrection is historical, it's, rela- it's relational, it's rational, sorry, and it's relational. Resurrection is a person. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, now, he didn't say I will or I may be or I was. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is not the someday. He is the right now resurrection. And he personifies himself as the resurrection. It isn't something he does. It isn't something he brings. He is, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is resurrection life. And what that means for you and I this morning is that the resurrection is a demonstration of the truth of all Christ's claims. And it's the trustworthiness of all his promises. It means because of the historical, rational reality of a personal living Jesus, we can put our faith and trust in him and experience. Experience. You can experience the historical, relational, rational reality of the not 2,000 years ago, but the right now, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead first and last, beginning and the end, Jesus. And because Jesus is resurrection, it means dead things don't stay dead when he's around. It means you don't have to be dead anymore. You don't have to be dead in doubt or dead in unbelief or dead in pain or dead in unforgiveness or dead in rejection or depression or addiction. You don't need to be dead in anger or gossip or pornography or lying or selfishness. We don't need to be dead in our trespasses and our sins because dead things don't stay dead when Jesus walks into a room. He is the resurrection and the life. So here we are. Back to our either or decision. Either Jesus was a liar or a lunatic. Either his disciples did accomplish the greatest hoax in human history, or this whole thing is as real as real can be. Would you stand with me this morning? Maybe by now you figured out where I stand on this whole thing. (laughs) My hope lives not because I'm not a sinner, but because I'm a sinner Christ died and rose again for. My trust is, it, 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 my trust is not that I am holy, but that being unholy, Christ is my righteousness. 
my faith doesn't rest in what I've done or what I feel or what I know, but what Christ has done and in what he is doing now for me. Because he is resurrection, you and I can live life and have life. Would you bow your head with me this morning? What about you? Where are you on the matter? Because the decision lies squarely with you this morning. No one else makes this decision for you. Either you embrace the resurrection of Jesus or you choose to walk away from its significance. But there are two ways you can walk away. Either you walk away and decide to reject the claims of the resurrection or you walk away a little like Peter did the first Easter morning, wondering, curious, open, maybe even a little hopeful. So where are you today? Have you decided? Listen to me carefully. If you came into the room today already a follower of Jesus and you want to reaffirm your commitment to him and say, I want to acknowledge, I embrace the resurrection today, would you raise your hand? If you're in the room today and you just want to say, that's me, I came a follower of Jesus, I'm leaving a follower of Jesus, I'm in. Excellent, wonderful hands all over the room. If you would not have considered yourself a follower of Jesus when you arrived today, but this morning you want to embrace Jesus and choose to embrace the resurrection life he has for you. You want to move from death to life this morning. You want to raise your hand and say, that's me. I'm making a brand new decision today to follow Jesus for the first time. I want to follow Jesus. Would you raise your hand right now in the room today? If you're making a first time commitment, say, I want to follow Jesus. Thank you. Maybe some of you are not ready to make that decision today, but you want to leave the room the same way Peter left the empty tomb. Curious, open, maybe a little hopeful. If you want to say, hey God, I'm not sure about all this, but I'm open and curious. You want God to reveal himself to you. Would you in a moment of honesty say, that's me by raising your hand? I'm not sure about this whole thing, but I, hey, if God's real, I... I'm willing to I'm willing to I'm willing to consider that. Thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. Would you pray with me? God, you know every heart today. Those who are in Christ, those who those who are wondering about all of it. Father, I pray that your spirit would work in the heart of every man, woman, boy and girl in the room today that you would bring life, that we can celebrate a risen Savior who takes us from, from death to life, from darkness to light. And God, we, 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 we celebrate you today. We celebrate the work of the cross. We celebrate, uh, we celebrate the risen Savior who, who, whose spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that dwells within each and every one of us who call on the name of Jesus. We stand victorious today over those barriers that, are, that stand between us and Christ. We stand victorious today over the whispers of the enemy because you've already made a show of him openly, triumphing over him in your death and your resurrection. And we who are... Who who are in Christ, we are co-crucified and co-buried and, and co-resurrected and co-seated and co-ascended and co-seated at the right hand of God. And we stand victorious over it all. And we thank you, Lord, that we can walk through life, not without pain, not without fear, not without doubt, but victorious over it. And we thank you we can do it not in our own strength, but the strength of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you thank the Lord today for the work that he's done? May the reality of the resurrection of Jesus fill you with hope and assurance. As you leave this place, may you carry, may you carry with you the truth that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And that dead things don't stay dead when he's present. May you experience the power of his resurrection in your life, bringing new life and transformation. May you live in the light of his truth, knowing that because he lives, you too can live. Go in peace, knowing that the God of resurrection goes with you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Have a great week.